Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Mr. President, Excellencies, Head of State, Government and Delegations, Ladies and Gentlemen, on behalf of the government and people of Pakistan, I convey to you, Mr. President, our warm congratulations on your elections to guide the work of this historic session of the UN General Assembly. I'm confident that your vast diplomatic experience and the sunny disposition of your beautiful island country will enable you to steer this assembly to a most successful conclusion. Mr. President, we are meeting at a tense and pivotal moment in modern history. Conflict rage in Ukraine and in 50 other places around the world. Tensions between the global powers have continued to escalate. We see the rise of new and old military and political blocs. Geopolitics is resurging when geoeconomics should have primacy in the world. The world cannot afford Cold War 2.0. There are far greater challenges confronting humankind which demand global cooperation and collective action. The world's economic prospects also appear gloomy. Global growth is slow. High interest rates could trigger a recession. A succession of exogenous shocks, COVID, conflict, and climate change have devastated the economies of many, many developing countries. Many countries of the global south have barely managed to stave off defaults. Poverty and hunger have grown, reversing the development gains of three decades. At yesterday's SDG summit, far-reaching commitments were made to implement the Sustainable Development Goals. We must ensure implementation of the SDG stimulus, the rechanneling of unused special drawing rights for development, development banks, and the resolution of the debt problems of the 59 countries in debt distress. Pakistan also looks forward to the fulfillment of the climate change commitments made at COP28 by the developed world to provide over 100 billion US dollars in annual climate finance. Allocate at least half of such finance for adaptation in developing countries. Operationalize the fund and funding arrangements for loss and damage and accelerate the carbon emission. Mitigation targets to keep alive. The goal of resisting, restricting global warming to 1.5 degrees centigrade. Attempts to selectively provide these funds on the basis of geopolitical considerations should be resisted. Mr. President, Pakistan's triple food, fuel, and finance challenge is a prime illustration of the impacts of COVID, conflicts, and climate on developing countries. Pakistan is one of the worst affected countries from the impacts of climate change. The epic floods of last summer submerged a third of our country, killed 1,700, and displaced over 8 million people, destroyed vital infrastructure, and caused over $30 billion in damage to Pakistan's economy. Pakistan is gratified by the commitment of over $10.5 billion for Pakistan's comprehensive plan for recovery, rehabilitation, and reconstruction with resilience. The 4RF plan at the Geneva Conference last January. Specific projects are being submitted to ensure timely funding and execution of the 4RF, 4RF plan. I hope our development partners will accord priority to allocation of funds for our resilient recovery plan, which has been costed at $13 billion. Mr. President, Pakistan government is committed to rapid economic recovery. 
we will stabilize our foreign exchange reserves in our currency, expand domestic revenues, and most importantly, mobilize significant domestic and external investment. Facilitation Council, SIFC, to expedite investment decisions. 28 projects have been identified in priority sectors, agriculture, mining, energy, and IT, for implementation in collaboration with Pakistan's partners. Pakistan's long-term shift to geoeconomics is well underway. The second phase of the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor has been initiated covering railway, infrastructure, and manufacturing projects. Pakistan also looks for forward to the early implementation of the connectivity projects with Central Asia. Mr. President, development depends on peace. Pakistan is situated in one of the least economically integrated region in the world. Pakistan believes that region develops together. Therefore, Pakistan desires peaceful and productive relations with all our neighbors, including India. Kashmir is the key to peace between Pakistan and India. The Jammu and Kashmir dispute is one of the oldest issues on the agenda of the Security Council. India has evaded implementation of the Security Council's resolutions, which call for the final disposition of Jammu and Kashmir to be decided by its people through UN-supervised plebiscite. Since 5th August 2019, India has deployed 900,000 troops in to impose the final solution for Kashmir. To this end, India has imposed extended lockdowns and curfews, jailed all genuine Kashmiri leaders, violently suppressed peaceful protests, resorted to extrajudicial killings of innocent Kashmiris in fake encounters, and so-called cordon and search operations and imposed collective punishments destroying entire villages. Access to occupied Kashmir demanded by the UN High Commission for Human Rights and over a dozen special repertoires has been denied by New Delhi. Mr. President, the UN Security Council must secure the implementation of its resolution on Kashmir. The UN Military Observer Group for India and Pakistan should be reinforced. Global powers should convince New Delhi to accept Pakistan's offer of mutual restraint on strategic and conventional weapons. Mr. President, peace in Afghanistan is a strategic imperative for Pakistan. Pakistan shares the concern of international community with respect to Afghanistan, particularly the rights of women and girls. Yet we advocate continued humanitarian assistance to a destitute Afghan population in which Afghan girls and women are the most vulnerable, as well as revival of the Afghan economy and implementation of the connectivity projects with Central Asia. Pakistan's first priority is to prevent and counter all, all terrorism from and within Afghanistan. Pakistan condemns the cross-border terrorist attacks against Pakistan by the TTP, Daesh, and other groups operating from Afghanistan. We have sought Kabul's support and cooperation to prevent these attacks. However, we are also taking necessary measures to end this externally encouraged terrorism. Mr. President, Pakistan welcomes the progress made towards ending the conflicts in Syria and Yemen. In particular, we warmly welcome the normalization of relations between the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and the Islamic Republic of Iran. Unfortunately, the tragedy of Palestine continues. With Israeli military raids, airstrikes, expansion of settlements, and eviction of Palestinians, Durable peace can be established 
only through a two-state solution and the establishment of a viable and contiguous Palestinian state within the pre-June 1967 borders, with Al-Quds al-Sharif as its capital. Mr. President, UN peacekeeping has been a success story. Over more than six decades, Pakistan has contributed 230,000 peacekeepers in 47 missions across the world. Today, UN peacekeepers face complex and unprecedented challenges, especially from criminal and terrorist groups, as in the Sahel. We must ensure the safety and security of peacekeepers. Pakistan shall continue to work with the UN to develop the capabilities and more robust mandates required for successful enforcement actions by UN and international forces where needed. Mr. President, we must counter all terrorists without discrimination, including the rising threat posed by far-right extremist and fascist groups, such as Hindutva-inspired extremists threatening genocide against India's Muslims and Christians alike. We also need to oppose state terrorism, address the root cause of terrorism, such as poverty, injustice, and foreign occupation, and distinguish genuine freedom struggles from terrorism. Pakistan prospers the creation of a committee of the General Assembly to oversee the balanced implementation of all four pillars of the global counterterrorism strategy. Mr. President, our progress based on rich history of cooperation, understanding, exchange, and synthesis of ideas among civilization is impelled today. The narratives advocating a clash of civilization have done considerable harm to humanity's progress. Such ideas have done considerable harm to uh, humanity's progress. Such ideas have bred extremism, hatred, and religious intolerance, including Islamophobia. Make no mistake, it's a latent threat that undermines millennia of progress. We need to cherish and celebrate our diversity and different ways of life, mutual respect, sanctity of religious symbols, scriptures, and personage should be ensured. While Islamophobia is an old, age-old phenomenon, however, after the 9-11 terrorist attacks, it has assumed epidemic proportions, as manifested in the negative profiling of Muslims and attacks on Islamic sites and symbols, such as the recent public burnings of the Holy Quran. Last year, this assembly adopted a resolution proposed by Pakistan on behalf of the OIC, declaring 15th March as the International Day to Combat Islamophobia. Earlier this year, the Human Rights Council adopted an OIC resolution submitted by Pakistan urging states to outlaw the burning of the Holy Quran and similar provocations. We welcome the legislation initiated by Denmark and contemplated by Sweden towards this end. Pakistan and the OIC countries will propose further steps to combat Islamophobia, including the appointment of a special envoy, creation of an Islamophobia data center legal assistance to victims and an accountability process to punish Islamophobic crimes. Mr. President, the complex global and regional challenges that the world faces today can be best addressed through effective multilateralism within the framework of the United Nations. However, multilateralism is being eschewed due to the unilateral policies of and strategic rivalry and tensions between global powers. Pakistan will continue to work actively to strengthen 
multilateral institutions and enhance global cooperation. Pakistan looks forward to continuing negotiation on the scope and elements of the summit of the future and the pact for the future, building on the convergence that emerged in earlier consultations. The summit's preparatory process must not disrupt existing negotiating processes, such as the intergovernmental negotiations on the reform of the Security Council. Mr. President, Pakistan does not believe in elitism with the Committee of Nations. The UN Charter principles of equality and sovereignty must be preserved in the interest of global peace and prosperity. Pakistan believes that ad additional permanent members to the Security Council will further erode its credibility and legitimacy. The widest possible agreement can be best achieved on the basis of the Uniting for Consensus Group's proposal for expansion of the Council only in the non-permanent category with provision for a limited number of long-term seats. Mr. President, Pakistan believes that to build, preserve, and promote peace and prosperity today and in the future, it is vital to reduce great power rivalry and tensions, ensure strict adherence to the UN Charter, consistently implement Security Council resolutions, eliminate the root cause of conflicts, and respect the principles of non-use of force, self-determination, sovereignty, and territorial integrity, non-interference in the internal affairs of the states, and peaceful coexistence. Pakistan will work diligently and actively with all member states to realize these vital elements of a new, equitable, and peaceful world order. I thank you. On behalf of the وزیر اعظم انوار الحق کاکڑ اقوام متحدہ کی جنرل اسمبلی سے خطاب کر رہے تھے اور اپنے خطاب میں انہوں نے اس کامیاب اجلاس پر مبارکباد دی سب سے پہلے اور اس کے بعد اپنے خطاب میں انہوں نے کہا کہ دنیا میں آج یوکرین سمیت پچاس جگہوں پر جنگ یا تصادم ہو رہا ہے ساتھ ساتھ انہوں نے کہا کہ دنیا ایک نئی سر جنگ کی متحمل نہیں ہو سکتی اور ساتھ ساتھ انہوں نے بھی کہا کہ کرونا اور تصادم اور مولیاتی تبدیلیوں سے تباہی کا سامنا کرنا پڑ رہا ہے دنیا میں غربت اور بھوک میں اضافہ ہو رہا ہے یہ بھی انہوں نے کہا کہ تمام مذاہب کا احترام یقینی بنانا ہوگا اور پاکستان موسمیاتی تبدیلی سے سب سے زیادہ متاثر ہونے والے ملکوں میں شامل ہیں ساتھ ساتھ انہوں نے ایس آئی ایف سی کے قیام کے بارے میں بھی کہا کہ اس کے قیام سرمایہ کاری کے فروغ کے عمل میں لائے گیا ہے اس کا قیام اور ساتھ ساتھ انہوں نے یہ بھی کہا کہ بھارت سمیت جو دیگر پڑوسی ممالک ہیں ان سب سے اچھے تعلقات کے خواہ ہیں اور بھارت نے مقبوضہ کشمیر میں کرفیو کا نفاظ کیا ہوا ہے اور ساتھ ساتھ انہوں نے کہا کہ بھارت نے حوریت رہنماؤں کو بھی نظر بند رکھا ہوا ہے اپنے خطاب میں انوار الحق کاکر نے بھی کہا کہ سلامتی کانسل کو کشمیر پر اپنی قراردادوں پر عمل کرانا چاہیے اور عالمی طاقتوں کو بھارت پر زور ڈالنا چاہیے مسئلہ کشمیر کا تنازعہ کشمیر کی امنگوں کے مطابق حل ہونا چاہیے انوار الحق کاکر نے اپنے خطاب میں کہا اور ساتھ ساتھ انہوں نے کہا کہ پاکستان انتہائی کم ترقی آفتہ خطے میں واقع ہے افغان حکومت کے حوالے سے بھی انہوں نے کہا کہ افغان حکومت کے تعاون سے دہشت گردی کا خاتمہ ممکن ہو سکتا ہے اسلام و فوبیا کے خطرات دنیا کی ترقی کی راہ میں رکاوٹ ہیں تمام مذاہب کا احترام کرنا ضروری ہے افغان عبوری حکومت سے تعاون کے خواہش مند ہے انوار الحق کاکر نے اقوام متحدہ کی جنرل سمنی اجلاس میں کہا کہ افغان حکومت کے تعاون سے دہشت گردی کا خاتمہ ہو سکتا ہے اور نائن الیون کے بعد اسلام و فوبیا میں اضافہ ہوا اسلام و فوبیا کی وجہ سے توہین مذہب توہین قرآن کے واقعات ہوتے ہیں سبسکرائب کریں اور بیل دبائیں تاکہ کوئی خبر رہ نہ جائے